Well, good morning, Greenville Oaks. It's good to see everybody here today. I invite you to come on in and find a seat as we uh, anticipate our gathering this morning and our time of worship. My name is Adam Looney, and I'm one of the ministers here, and I am so privileged to be uh, able to share in this time of worship with you. It's a privilege to get to uh, uh, lead you all as we come into the throne room of God together. If you are joining us online this morning, thank you for clicking in. I know you have a lot of choices out there, uh, but we're grateful that you choose uh, to be with us this morning, and I pray that this time will be a time of encouragement. All right, it is time to begin, so I'll ask you to stand. Let's sing together. This is the new one we've been working on. We're bringing it back. Raise our victory banner, for the Lord is one. Come and celebrate what the Lord has done. For the joy before Him, He endured the cross. He was thinking of everyone. Israel's race, she ransomed from the fall. Hail him who saved. 
and welcome to Greenville Oaks. If this is your first Sunday with us, we're especially glad that you are here. We're a church seeking to inspire people to follow Jesus each and every day. There's lots of exciting things happening around Greenville Oaks and we want to make sure that you don't miss out on any of it. If you're a guest with us, come see me at the welcome area. One of our values is combating isolation and we invite you to do that with friends over a cup of coffee in our new coffee bar. And once you've got your coffee, Feel free to hang out and enjoy the Maloney family room. Parents, be sure to check in your kids at our new check-in area. We love our kids at Greenville Oaks, and our nursery is open the entire morning for babies and toddlers. And just a little bit later on in our worship services, we'll be partaking of a communion service, and we invite you all to make sure you go to one of the tables around the worship center and pick up the communion elements. And don't forget to click on the QR code in the seat back in front of you. That QR code will take you to all the different things that are happening in and around the Greenville Oaks Church of Christ. And don't forget about the Greenville Oaks app. Go to your app store on your phone and search Greenville Oaks Church of Christ and download the Go Church app. Again, we really are glad that you're here and that you've come to worship with us this morning. All right, good morning. My name is Matt Mazza. This is Zach Silva, the student minister at Greenville Oaks. If you are a guest with us, again, I just want to say once more, we are thankful that you have joined us. And as Adam said, good morning to you watching online, wherever you may be, we're thankful that you're joining us this morning. We've got several things that we need to go over with you, so bear with us. Lots of exciting things happening. Uh, you heard in the video Michelle Rainey talk about one of the values around Greenville Oaks is combating isolation. Another one of our uh, values is demonstrating selflessness. The idea of giving back, serving, and helping. If you've been around Greenville Oaks for the last several years, you've heard us talk about a, a very significant event that happens annually in the month of May around the city of Allen, and it's something called Change the World. Change the World is a cooperative effort of churches and businesses and civic groups and the city and, and organizations coming together to serve uh, our friends and our neighbors and our community who are a little less fortunate and need, need some help. And uh, so I want to invite all of us to step into, to lean into the opportunity of serving our neighbors by being a part of Change the World. You can go to changetheworld.org. Uh, Greenville Oaks is one of the many churches. A lot of churches and organizations around Allen are participating in this. James Brown, one of our shepherds, is kind of the liaison that, uh, that works with Change the World and representing Greenville Oaks. And so you can always talk to James if you have any questions or come talk to me. But get your family, your friends, your connect group, your gathering circle, get some people gathered up from here and sign up and be a part of serving. May 3rd, 4th, and 5th, you can go onto the website. You can pick a day pick a time, pick a service project that you want to be a part of, and just simply step out and make a difference in the life of one of our neighbors. So be a part of Change the World uh, here in just a couple weeks. Is that? Summer is quickly approaching, and the end of school year is near, and one way we celebrate that here at Greenville Oaks is with Senior Sunday. Here in two weeks on May 5th, we will honor our graduating seniors during our worship service during first and second service, and also there will be a time of celebration in between services in the 180s where we, you can come by and offer gifts, well wishings, and celebrate our graduating class. And during second service, our student band will be leading us in worship, and I'm super excited for that weekend. Also coming up this summer is day camp. It is time to register your kids for day camp. This year's theme is start the party because God's news is good news and it's worth celebrating. So go ahead and register your kids. The dates will be June 3rd through the 6th from 9 a.m. to 12 here at the Greenville Oaks building. Also coming up this summer, parents, all my student ministry parents in the room, uh, back to school retreat is coming quickly. And next week, just a little bit of a heads up, next week early bird will close April 28th. Go ahead and register now and pay your deposit and you will lock in that early bird price. 
just a few of the many things that are happening around Greenville Oaks this summer. So moms, dads, kids, grandparents, pay attention. The calendar is starting to get really busy and full as lots of activity is happening around here. One of the other things that's happening is something that has happened for many years now in the month of July, and that is the Belize Mission Trip. We're excited that once again, we've got 24 people from Greenville Oaks that are going to be going and serving in Corazal, Belize. And so here's what I want to ask you to do. First of all, above all else, we ask that you begin praying about this mission trip. The 24 people that are going to be going and the city of Corzal, the church, the Corzal Church of Christ, uh, the school there that we'll be working with, the kids and the families, and the opportunity for God to use us to be his hands and his feet to make a difference in that place. So please be praying about this mission trip. And the other thing I want to invite you to participate in is the opportunity to just help us with some of the expenses, some of the costs, due to some budget constraints. Uh, the missions team here at Greenville Oaks is helping support the mission trip some, but not as much as maybe in the past. And so we're going to invite any of you that maybe have a heart for missions or a desire to see some of our, some of our students and some of our families be able to participate in this mission effort and be willing to donate to help us underwrite some of the costs. There's lots of resources and materials and expenses and equipment and things that we have to take down to go and do this mission trip in July. So be aware of this opportunity. Come talk to me if you have any questions, Michelle Rainey or Janetta Voss, and uh, we're happy to share with you more about Belize. But we invite you to be a part of it, even if you're not going to Belize. Be a part of it by helping support financially uh, this wonderful mission effort and uh, and help reduce the cost for those that are going to be going. One final thing I want to make sure you're aware of, and that is Discover Greenville Oaks is going to be happening next Sunday, April 28th. So if you're a guest sitting in this room, or maybe you're watching online and you're just not here this morning, we invite you to come next Sunday and learn more about Greenville Oaks. We've had lots of people placing membership over the last several months, and we're excited the way God is blessing us with new people. We want to keep that going. And so we invite you to come learn more about who we are as a church, to see if this is, in fact, the place that God is calling you to be. So come join us if you're a guest or just curious about Greenville Oaks at DGO. Discover Greenville Oaks next Sunday, April 28th, in between our two services. Finally, I invite you to stand from a reading from God's Word as we transition back into worship. Psalm 34. I will extol the Lord at all times. His praise will always be on my lips. I will glory in the Lord, let the afflicted hear and rejoice. Glorify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name together. Strength will rise as we wait upon the Lord. Wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. Strength will rise as we wait upon the Lord. Wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord our God. You reign for.
wait upon the Lord. Wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. Strength will rise as we wait upon the Lord. Wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. You are the to the table this morning, and no matter where you've been, no matter what you have done, 
whether you're in a great place or whether you're in a bad place. There is a place for you at this table. So I invite you to come as we share in this supper together, as we remember what the Savior of the world did for us. Let's pray. Father God, we gather in this place. And Father, we come from all different walks of life and backgrounds and from all different places, spiritually, mentally, emotionally today. And we gather at your table, a place where we don't have to be anything but ourselves. We don't have to pretend, and we don't have to wonder if we belong because of the great sacrifice of your Son on that cross. It is the great leveling field that puts us all together, all on the same level, all needing your love, your mercy, your grace, all needing the sacrifice on our behalf. And you sent your son to bring us back into relationship with you. Thank you, Father, for a place of belonging. Thank you, Father, that each one of us has our name written here. Father, we remember what you have done for us with grateful hearts. We love you. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. The bread of Christ given for you. The blood of Christ shed for you. Light of the world, you step down into darkness. Open my eyes, let me see. Beauty that made this heart adore you. Hope of a life spent with you. Here I am to worship.
friends three years through fifth grade. You guys can be dismissed to children's worship. Miss Samantha and all the wonderful children's ministry volunteers are there ready to receive you. If you are a guest today, would like your kiddos to be a part of uh, what's going on in our children's worship. It's, exci- it's exciting. You should take them back there. Uh, just follow the crowd and there'll be uh, uh, volunteers to help you get checked in and to see where your kiddos will be. All right. As they're being dismissed, let's stand together. Let's sing this one last song here before Wade brings us his message, Just As I Am. Just as I am without one leave, that I blood was shed.
one of my favorite verses from one of my favorite books in the Bible is Ecclesiastes chapter 8, verse 17, in which the teacher advises us, do not be over-righteous, neither be over-wise. You didn't think you'd hear that in church today, did you? Why destroy yourself? And do not be over-wicked, and do not be a fool. Why die before your time? It is good to grasp the one and not let go of the other. Whoever fears God will avoid all extremes. And that is certainly what I'm trying to do in this series. Hopefully by now you see that one extreme I have absolutely no interest in promoting is the extreme that mental health can be reduced exclusively to a spiritual issue. Mental health challenges cannot be reduced to a lack of faith or a lack of prayer or a lack of Bible knowledge or unconfessed sin. And nor does being faithful to God mean that God is going to protect us from all mental health challenges or immediately and completely heal us when we cry out for help. In the first draft of this message, I included at this point a theological explanation for why so many Christians are predisposed toward this extreme of over-spiritualizing mental health. And it included a fairly detailed discourse on the Gnostic heresy and Cartesian dualism, which sees the body and the soul, which for purposes of our discussion include the mind, the body and the soul mind, as radically separate entities. Meaning that whatever happens within the body need not have any impact on the soul or the mind. Especially if the soul mind is connected to God and is receiving special power and knowledge from God via the Spirit and therefore elevating the body and the mind over the lowly and fleshly imperfect functions of the body. And this perspective is rooted in a misunderstanding. Some might even call it a heresy that God isn't interested in saving our bodies, only our souls. And I must confess to you that the main reason I wanted initially to say all of that in this message was to show you how smart I am. <laughs> but then when I went back and read what I had written, I realized I'm not smart enough to pretend I understand what I wrote. <laughs> so don't worry. I'm not going to say any of that in this message. <laughs> Instead, I will simply say that we are embodied souls. Our souls, our minds, have a body. And our bodies and souls and minds are fearfully and wonderfully connected. And to separate our mental health challenges from the concerns or the challenges of the body is to ignore one of the fundamental hopes of the gospel, which Paul describes in Romans 8.23 as the redemption, not of our souls, not of our minds, but the redemption of our bodies. Resurrection hope, gospel hope, includes the hope of spiritual and physical transformation. There is 
an undeniable physiological component to our mental health. What happens to and within our bodies has an impact, has an effect on how we see, think, and feel about ourselves, about other people, about experiences and events, about life itself. The body keeps the score. The body sets the tone. The body establishes the mood. Or as those Snicker commercials told us years ago, you're not you when you're hungry. (laughs) That's biblical. (laughs) I am not kidding. In 1 Kings 19, there is an insightful interaction between the prophet Elijah and the Lord. Elijah's being pursued by evil Queen Jezebel after he defeats her false prophets in a showdown. And we pick up the story in 1 Kings chapter 19, verse 3. Elijah was afraid and ran for his life. And he came to a broom bush. If you want to know what those look like, read Dr. Seuss. <laughs> he sat down under it and prayed that he might die. I have had enough, Lord. Take my life. I am no better than my ancestors. It sounds to me like the prophet Elijah is having a mental health challenge. Doesn't it sound that way to you? He says, I'm done. I can't do it anymore. I'm burned out. I'm depressed. I'm despairing. I don't know what we would diagnose here in this exchange, but he says, I'm done. I can't do it. Take me. I want this to end. And if we keep reading, we see in verse 5 that then he lay down under the bush and fell asleep. And all at once an angel touched him and said, get up and eat. (laughs) He looked around, and there by his head was some bread baked over hot coals and a jar of water. He ate and drank, and then he lay down again. The angel of the Lord came back a second time and touched him and said, get up and eat, for the journey is too much for you. So he got up and ate, and drank. Later on in that chapter, Elijah is going to have an encouraging conversation with the Lord. But what he needed first, what had to happen before his encounter with the Lord, is Elijah needed to eat some food and take a nap. You are not you when you are hungry or exhausted. You are not you when the different systems in your body, including your nervous system, are not functioning properly. There is a physiological, a physical, a biological component to mental health. Which is why there's absolutely no shame in taking medication to regulate a physical condition that is impacting your mental health. The way you see, feel, and think about yourself, others, events, the world, life. Forgive me for being Captain Obvious, but the brain is an organ in the body that sometimes requires medical attention, just like other organs and body parts require medical attention. And what is so obvious to me now was not obvious back in 2008 when I had a conversation with a trusted friend and elder in the church I was serving in Tulsa, Oklahoma. He was also a psychiatrist. And one Wednesday night in a meandering impromptu conversation in my office, I described to him a heaviness I was feeling that I could not get out from under. It was sapping me of my energy, my ambition, my optimism, my get up and go, as my dad likes to say. 
And as I described what I was experiencing and feeling, my friend, elder, and he wasn't my psychiatrist, but he was a psychiatrist, gently suggested that I might be suffering from situational depression brought about by a particularly difficult and discouraging season of ministry at our church that he understood all too well. And then he suggested that I make an appointment with a doctor and explore the possibility of taking an antidepressant. And that I was depressed was not a notion I resisted. I knew something was wrong. I was miserable. And I had been wrestling with it long enough that I knew I could not think or talk or pray or eat my way out of it. And back then, eating was my preferred coping mechanism. The notion I resisted was that I needed to take a little white pill to make me feel better. And this resistance was fueled by a toxic mix of masculine bravado and superior spirituality. In other words, I thought that a real man, especially a man who stood up every week in front of others to announce good news, should not need an antidepressant. My friend asked me, if you went to see your doctor and he told you that you had high blood pressure and there was a pill you could take to help regulate it, would you take it? And I said, yeah. And he said, well, if you went to see your doctor and he told you that there is a chemical imbalance in your brain that is causing you to feel the way you do right now and that there is a pill you can take to help balance those chemicals so you can start feeling better. Would you take it? And I said, yeah. And he said, go see a doctor. And that conversation changed my life. It altered the trajectory of my life. I went to see a doctor, and I began taking an antidepressant. And I started to feel better. And I thank God for that little white pill. It got me unstuck. It gave me the energy and the clarity to make other life-giving changes around diet and exercise. And a year later, it helped me muster the courage to leave that church, which was hurting me. Being there was hurting me. And to take the risk to do something new that I had always wanted to try. Medication can be a gift from God when we experience a mental health challenge. And I use that term broadly. It includes diagnosable mental health illnesses. But notice I said can be. Because I am increasingly aware through my conversations and research that not all medication is equally effective for everyone. Remember two weeks ago I said we have to be very careful of overgeneralizing anything in this conversation? Well, I'm learning that to flippantly suggest to someone who describes a mental health challenge, we'll go see a doctor and get a prescription, can be just as insensitive and just as oversimplified as saying, well, you just need to pray more. Is dialing in the dosage of a medication Dealing with the side effects of a medication, some of which can be almost as bad as the original ailment, can be a frustrating and discouraging experience for some. And I know some of you know exactly what I'm talking about. 
we must not overgeneralize anything. But thankfully, there are some other physical interventions in addition to medication, like diet and exercise, sunshine and sleep, breath work and cold showers, I took one myself this morning, that many report to be helpful in managing their mental health challenges like depression and anxiety. There is a physiological component to our mental health. And what we do with our bodies, what we do to our bodies has an impact on our mental health. In a recent study out of Australia, scientists compared 218 different studies. This was a massive study. Compared 218 studies that compared different forms of exercise to the most common prescription medications for depression. And in these studies, 12 different forms of exercise were found to be just as effective, if not more effective, than those common medications. Coming in at number three and number two were walking and jogging. Coming in at number one, the most effective exercise for managing depression is dancing. Have I become your enemy by speaking the truth? <laughs> it's like Steve Martin used to say in his old stand-up routine from the 70s, uh-oh, I'm getting happy feet. <laughs> Turns out, all of those sermons about the evils of dancing some of us heard in church growing up were absolutely wrong, just not for the reasons we supposed when we were in eighth grade. Now, I share those examples with you not to discourage anyone from going to see a doctor or exploring taking medication for a mental health challenge. Absolutely not. I am not a doctor, nor do I play one on TV. I share those examples, rather, to encourage all of us who may be experiencing a variety of mental health challenges to varying degrees to adopt a more holistic approach to cultivating and maintaining good mental health by paying attention to our bodies, which are a gift from God in which God intends to redeem and transform. Paying attention to our bodies, which includes paying attention to what we put into our bodies and how vigorously and how often we move our bodies, and how intentionally and often we slow down and rest our bodies. There is a physical component to mental health. That's part one of this message. We avoid the first extreme, over-spiritualizing mental health, by accepting and appreciating and acting on the physical component of mental health, part one. Now comes part two. We must also be careful not to move over to the other side of the spectrum and embrace the opposite extreme which is to view all mental health challenges as a physical, biological, or medical issue. If one extreme is over-spiritualizing mental health, the other extreme is over-materializing mental health. And when we reduce our mental health challenges to merely a physical, biological, medical issue, it is tempting and easy to eliminate God from the equation or the conversation, especially when we appropriately lower our expectations of God immediately and completely healing us of everything that ails us. It is true, we are embodied souls. Our souls have a body. 
It is also true, and it is equally important to remember, that we are ensouled bodies. Our bodies have a soul. You have a soul that is more than your body. And just as we must pay attention to our bodies, we must also pay attention to our souls. And we attend our souls by paying attention to God. Numerous studies have found that religious belief, faith in God, church attendance, participating in a community of faith of some kind promotes good mental health. On average, people who are religious and participating in religious activities, believing in God, acting on those beliefs, on average, have better mental health than those who do not. Paying attention to God is good for us. It can, on average, make us feel better. Paying attention to God also opens us up to power and help from God to do difficult things that time and time again we demonstrate we cannot do without God. How many seemingly impossible journeys toward recovery have begun with these words. We admitted we were powerless over alcohol or some other addiction, and that our lives had become unmanageable, and we came to believe that a power greater than ourselves could restore us to sanity, and we made a decision to turn our will and our lives over to the care of God as we understood him. We pay attention to God because God provides the help we need in our struggles. Paying attention to God also makes us more aware of just how much God is always paying attention to us. After eating some food and taking a nap, the prophet Elijah has an encounter with the Lord. As important as food and rest were to him, it was not enough. As Jesus said in the wilderness while being tempted by the devil, we do not live on bread alone. So if you keep reading in 1 Kings chapter 19, you'll see that Elijah meets up with the Lord. And he presents to the Lord his complaint. And his complaint is, I am all alone in this. That's why I'm ready to give up. No one's left. No one else is faithful to you. No one else is trying to do the right thing. I'm the only one who's not bowing down and worshiping a false god. I'm ready to go. And the first thing the Lord does in response to Elijah's complaint is assure him that he is not alone by reminding Elijah that he is in the presence of the Lord. The Lord wants Elijah to see he is not going through his struggle alone. And the second thing the Lord does is tell Elijah to go appoint Elisha as his apprentice who will take over for him. He gives him a partner. The Lord wants Elijah to see he is not going through his struggle alone. And then the third thing the Lord does is reveal that there are still 7,000 others who, like Elijah, have not yet bowed the knee to a false god. The Lord wants to make sure Elijah knows he is not going through his struggle alone. God is with us. And we are sometimes made aware of God's presence when we are alone in prayer and there's a whisper deep in our heart. And sometimes 
We know God is with us because God sends us to be with others. Family, friends, a doctor, a therapist, a counselor. And sometimes God sends others to be with us. But no matter what, we are not on this journey alone. There is a physiological component to our mental health. There is also a spiritual component to our mental health. And so we pay attention to our bodies and what's going on inside of us. But we also pay attention to God, who is always there walking beside us. Would you stand, please, and read this benediction out loud with me? I didn't intend it when we began the series, but this is the benediction for this series. It tumbled out of me at the end of my first message, and now it seems an appropriate way to end all of these messages. Let's read this out loud together. We are not alone. We have God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We have the Scriptures, a cloud of witnesses giving us hope. We have the church. We have each other. We are not alone. And the church said, I come broken to be mended. I come wounded to be healed. I come desperate to be rescued. I come empty to be filled. I come guilty to be pardoned by the blood of Christ the Lamb. day.